Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's SIAC India webinar on evolution of arbitration in India and Singapore, perspectives from the bench. Thank you for taking out the time on a Saturday to join us for this very special webinar. We're deeply honored that for this session, we have esteemed members of judiciary as panelists. Honorable Justice Stephen Chong, Justice of Court of Appeal of the Singapore Court, Supreme Court of Singapore, Honorable Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaul, Judge of the Supreme Court of India, the Right Honorable Lord Jonathan Menz, former Deputy President of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom and International Judge of the Singapore International Commercial Court, and Honorable Justice Indu Malhotra, former Judge of the Supreme Court of India. The session will be moderated by Mr. Toby Landau, QC, member of the SIAC Court of Arbitration, Barrister and Arbitrator at Essex Court Chambers. Before we start today's session, I would like to invite Mr. Rajiv Lutra, member of the SIC Board of Directors and founder and managing partner of LLN Partners to give the welcome address. Mr. Lutra, please. Ladyship, my lords, my seniors and friends, welcome. As Shweta said, uh, I'm Rajiv Lutra, the founder and managing partner of Lutra and Lutra Law Offices and director on the board of SIAC. I'm happy to tell you that we have participants right now from over 15 countries and maybe about 350 to uh, 350 plus uh, people hearing us. Today, as Shweta said, we have a galaxy of stars present, each as accomplished as one could be. She did introduce some of them, but uh, I think there was something lacking. So I'll just say a few words on each one of them. Justice Chong, a distinguished career as an advocate, Justice Stephen Chong currently serves as a judge of appeal in the Court of Appeal, the highest court in Singapore. Honorable Justice Sanjay Krishan Kaul, judge of the Supreme Court of India. Justice Kaul hails from Kashmir, and has had a distinguished career as a lawyer, judge, and chancellor. He has been instrumental in setting India's most progressive judicial precedents, having famously said, and I quote, pluralism is the soul of democracy. There should be freedom for the thought we hate. Freedom of speech has no meaning if there's no freedom after speech, unquote. Then we have the Right Honorable Lord Jonathan Mance. I won't talk about his yesterday's email, but uh, I'll go jump in straight. He's, he was the former Deputy President of United Kingdom Supreme Court, international judge at the Supre uh, Singapore International Commercial Court. He went from recorder in 1990 to Deputy President of the Supreme Court of United Kingdom in 2017. If his love for the legal profession wasn't already apparent, he and his lady wife, sorry, he and his wife, Lady Arden, are the first ever married couple to serve concurrently in the Court of Appeal or consecutively in the Supreme Court. Hmm. Then, of course, we have Justice Arjun Sikri, who unfortunately has not been able to join us yet. He might. He's stuck in traffic somewhere. There's a little bit of agitation going on in Delhi. And, of course, I'll quickly tell you that apart from being uh, a judge, in our, a, a former judge at our Supreme Court of India, there's one very interesting distinction he has from most of us. He stood third in India in higher secondary school, which is... Uh, 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 and he has been achievers and overachievers since then. Then we have Justice Hindu Malhotra, who just demitted office at the Supreme Court only two weeks ago, a little bit less. She also is the first woman to have been elevated directly to the Supreme Court from the bar in the history of Indian judiciary. Oh. And those of us from the Indian bar remember Justice Malhotra's late father, O.P. Malhotra, with great fondness, certainly I do. 
himself an icon in the field of arbitration law. I have not only had the good fortune to meet him in my younger days, but also reading his incredible work. His daughter, Justice Indu Malhotra, has picked up the baton last year, and we welcome the fourth edition of Malhotra's commentary on law of arbitration from her able hands. Of course, we have Toby Landau, QC, respected moderator, and it's been explained that he's a, a member of the CI Court of Arbitration, barrister, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, Toby holds a first class law degree from BCL Oxford and LLM from Harvard Law School. You recognize that tie, Toby? As well as the distinguished title of QC. Mm -hmm. Apart from this, Toby has two claims to fame. One, his lovely wife, Nudra, who's not only a barrister, but an international arbitrator as well. And of course, his gorgeous daughter, Zakia. His second claim to fame is, he's the only serving Queen's Council in the history of the world who serves as my intern. I graciously gave him that job. Thank you, Toby. Greetings wherever you are in the world. Welcome to this very special SIAC India webinar on the topic of evolution of arbitration in India and Singapore. Perspectives from the bench. On behalf of SIAC, I'm deeply honored that the esteemed members of the judiciary from India and Singapore, who are unparalleled in quality and experience and compromising the very best in class, are participating in this special webinar. We know that national courts play a crucial role in the arbitration process and the approach of the judiciary towards arbitration related matter determines to a large extent the popularity of a jurisdiction as a seat of arbitration. India and Singapore are regarded as the two major jurisdictions with their unique and distinct journey in the international arbitration. Both have undertaken significant steps through legislative and judicial developments to facilitate and promote international arbitration. While India is setting the stage to become a hub for international arbitration, it can draw on the experience of other jurisdictions, whose, those regarded amongst the most preferred arbitration seats in the world. In today's session, the honorable judges will share their perspectives on various important aspects of international arbitration and discuss how their own jurisdictions found its feet and then balance in the world of international arbitration. In India, as someone wise said, the evolution of arbitration has followed a zigzag crab-like course. Ironically, pepper crab is my favorite dish in Singapore. It has moved forward, it has moved backwards, and lots of times it has moved sideways. We hope to learn if other jurisdictions too, the law has meandered and progressed similarly and draw crucial lessons. Thank you for being with us today and taking time out of your busy schedules. While COVID has shaken up things, I'm sure the ideas and thoughts of our great panel will prove to be far more contagious in a far more enjoyable manner. I wish you all good health and happiness. Toby, your mic. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Uh, I'll start by just putting on record that for all my years of training at university and vocational training, it was the one day in the offices of Luther and Luther, which has been particularly formative uh, from a technical, ethical, and spiritual perspective. Um, and there is one question also I'm going to just put straight away to Mr. Luther before we begin, because it's a question that we've been asked by many people, and that is, who is the second Luther? Isn't it a parent in turn? Both are me. <laughs> Excellent. So that's clarified that. Thank you very much. And with that, we'll start. The, uh, I'll start just with a few uh, introductory points to set the scene. Um, and, and then, we'll, uh, and then we'll, we'll begin with some questions. 
Um, the, the importance of establishing a stable, recognized, respected legal environment for international arbitration is now universally accepted. India, uh, in, in many, many areas of uh, cities of India, London, uh, Singapore, uh, they're all now prominent players. And they have a common aim to develop and to maintain themselves as international arbitration hubs uh, and indeed regional hubs. There, there are a number of different ingredients to become a successful international arbitration center. Part of it is legislation, part of it is the legal profession, part of it is infrastructure, but of course, a critical element is judiciary. And at the very heart of the system of international arbitration is a delicate but critical relationship between arbitration and national courts. It's finely balanced, it has to be very carefully calibrated, and it can be the very success or the very downfall of an arbitral seat. There are, of course, a number of different interactions that happen in the life of an arbitration with national courts. From the beginning, references to arbitration, stays of proceedings in court, through appointment of arbitrators, interim measures, assistance in taking evidence, anti-suit injunctions, anti-arbitration injunctions, and then setting aside, and then recognition and enforcement. Uh, we have a unique opportunity today uh, to, to explore the judicial perspective on that relationship. That's in terms of the contribution that judges can make to a successful arbitration seat, and the perspective of the judiciary on how to calibrate the relationship between court and arbitration. It's a very special gathering of judges, and it's a very special opportunity for me as counsel for once to ask the questions. Uh, so with that, um, the format will be a free-flowing, and I must warn everybody, completely unrehearsed discussion. With no preparatory meetings before this, it'll be a white knuckle ride for the moderator. We're going to go through a number of different issues, uh, which I will pass around the panel. Uh, and then at the end, we will hopefully have time for, well, we will have time for questions, which can be put, I think, through the chat function, uh, and we'll come to them at the end. And uh, the one uh, preparatory remark I'll say is that, of course, with any judges who are still sitting, um, there, there's uh, every understanding that you will not want to be drawn necessarily on live substantive issues. So uh, we'll, we'll see, obviously, as to how far we can go on some of the topics. I, I want to start by putting to the panel um, a, a moment of sort of reflection, stepping back to think about the overall approach and the overall philosophy of courts with respect to arbitration matters. How do you, as judges, view the role of national courts in supporting the arbitration process at different stages of, of an arbitration? We'll come later to some of the more specifics. But if one stands back and thinks in terms of the general philosophy, the general role of judges with respect to arbitration, how, how, do, you, how do you view that? And I'm going to start, um, if I may, with uh, Justice Malhotra. Well, I feel that the courts play an integral part in supporting the arbitral process, uh, particularly after the 2015 amendments to the Indian Arbitration Act. The legislative policy has been to minimize judicial intervention, particularly at the pre-reference stage. And the courts have also rendered a series of judgments saying that there will be no interference while exercising the default power of appointment. And that is being strictly followed. There are a series of judgments delivered by Justice Nariman and some have been delivered by me. In fact, the latest one I delivered was just two days before I demitted office, which was on the 10th of March, wherein we have said that there can be no adjudication of any preliminary or threshold issues, except in the very limited category, if the disputes are non-arbitrable or if they are ex facie completely lacking in any kind of merit or a time bar. And of course, one doesn't go into the merit. But the entire perspective today of the court is no interference at the pre-reference stage or during the arbitral process. Even the power to grant interim relief is just limited till the tribunal gets constituted. So that's basically the approach which is being followed 
by the high courts and the Supreme Court. And one very important issue is that after the 2015 amendment, exclusive power with respect to international commercial arbitrations is now vested in the high courts. So there are only two steps. It's the high court and it's the Supreme Court. And I think most of the courts uh, in India, the high courts, and of course the Supreme Court have been extremely progressive in their approach, um, revealing a pro-arbitration perspective. How, how would you chart the development of that pro-arbitration perspective in India? Speaking frankly, yes. uh, from, a, from an outsider's perspective, yes. the, repu the reputation of India alongside many other countries has been that um, there has been a history of perhaps judicial mistrust of arbitration and a willingness, a willingness to intervene. So, so what, has there really been a, a sort of a cultural change, a philosophical change, and how has that happened? I think, uh, frankly speaking, that is an archaic view of India. Since 2015, there has been a major and significant change in the arbitration landscape. There is, I don't think, a single award under the 1996 Act, the, a foreign award which has not been enforced in our country. The problem which arises, and I will speak very frankly, is at the stage of objections being filed to the award. That is the only stage when judicial scrutiny comes in. You have to understand one thing. India is a very vast country with 1.2 billion people. And it is catering to such a large mass of population that the uh, main roadblock comes in disposal of the objections to the award in India. That's where the uh, longest time is taken. The appeals get done swiftly. Supreme Court has been extremely swift in international arbitrations. In fact, we have disposed of, I have done it, Justice Nariman has done it. Our benches have disposed of matters which came to the Supreme Court within a couple of months. But the major roadblock actually is at the first stage when objections are filed to the award, that takes some time to get disposed of. And the change really took place when the government realized that the 1996 Act, over its working for almost 20 years, the entire process was very lethargic. There were no timelines. It was most, it's, it was unregulated because most of the arbitrations were ad hoc and they were not institutionalized. So uh, there was a committee which was set up and the law commission made recommendations and a huge change was brought about in the act, significant amendments, which has laid down timelines, you know, that statutory timelines for completion of proceedings. There are provisions which have incorporated um, uh, 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 provision for conflict of interest of arbitrators. So, uh, you know, they are very, very particular. In fact, I think we are the only jurisdiction in the world which has given statutory flavor to the IBA guidelines by incorporating it in a schedule to our act. And then statutorily, we have narrowed down the public policy uh, defense when an award is uh, to be declined uh, enforcement. In all other countries, it's, it's broadly defined as public policy of the country concerned. Here, they have said it's only three grounds which can constitute the public policy of India and none others, and extremely narrowly constructed. So from 2015, there was a major change. And with that, contemporaneously, there were commercial courts set up. So now one did not require to go to a district court which was concerned exercising original jurisdiction. It would be always the high courts or the commercial courts of a particular state from which it would flow to the Supreme Court. So India was certainly very concerned with respect to foreign direct investment to provide an expeditious mode of dispute resolution that, you know, the major change came in 2015 and our ranking went up by the World Bank that, uh, you know, we were a pro-arbitration jurisdiction. And 2019, there has been a concerted move for institutionalization of arbitration, but some of those amendments are yet to be brought into force because the government is trying to set up a centralized institution which has yet to take off the ground. So that aspect is yet to be uh, worked upon. So broadly, that has been the perspective. And in, with respect to foreign enforcement, uh, enforcement of foreign awards, there have been uh, major changes also to provide an expeditious path for enforcement of foreign awards. There are procedural requirements have been relaxed. 
periods of limitation have been spelt out. Then there are judgments wherein they have said no review on the merits of the award. And believe me, I think it would be very rare. I don't think Supreme Court has declined enforcement of a foreign award even in one case uh, under the 96 Act. So there is a major change in the perspective, both legislatively and judicially. Can, can I ask um, uh, Justice Chong, how, how would you compare the Singapore uh, perspective and the development of the philosophy of judicial intervention in Singapore? I think the first observation I would make is that every established um, arbitration center is supported by a mature, sophisticated judiciary. Uh, and that in itself underscores the importance of the judiciary in um, uh, attracting arbitration work to that particular jurisdiction. And I mean, similar to India, I, I think that the two sort of uh, uh, pillars of, uh, uh, which uh, guide our decisions are the principles of uh, respecting party autonomy and the principle of minimal curial intervention. But at the same time, uh, I think it's important that the judiciary must act in a robust manner when the circumstances require us to do so by way of entering measures, setting aside the ward, or finding arbitrators not uh, when they have exceeded jurisdiction. We don't uh, you know, deal with the, the merits, of course, and, and our views has consistently been that if the arbitrators get it wrong, a uh, complete mess, well, you, you've chosen that process and you must live with the consequences. So we're not going to uh, undo what the arbitrators should have done properly. So as far as the merits is concerned, we, we, we draw a very clear line. But two uh, other points, which I think is important to uh, kind of underscore the Singapore judiciary's role in the arbitral process. Number one, we typically uh, allocate arbitration cases in a special track. In other words, they come to court before the courts in, a, in, a, in an expedited manner because we recognize that uh, you know, interim measures, uh, setting aside awards, may well have impact on, on, uh, on the, the, the parties. And therefore, it is important that uh, the Singapore judiciary uh, provides a kind of robust support to the arbitral process. So in that sense, we, 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 we identify and, 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 and um, assign what we call special track to arbitration related cases. This, the, the other way which we, we, we do is to communicate to the legislature through our judgments. We don't make laws. Uh, when, when we identify a gap in the act, for example, or a gap in the SIAC rules, we would uh, typically uh, mention those gaps in the judgment. And uh, fortunately, in our experience, uh, the legislature has been very uh, proactive uh, and, 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 and reactive also, and would typically uh, um, um, amend the laws to to uh, fill those gaps. So all in all, I, I mean, we recognize that um, there are many moving parts in an arbitral process. Uh, the judiciary plays a very important role in actually managing that process, as well as also communicating with the legislature when the situation requires. Thank you very much. Uh, can I turn it over to Lord Mance? Uh, Lord Mance uh, bridges two, two jurisdictions, at least, uh, Singapore and, and uh, England. Uh, but focusing on England, how would you compare England's journey to where it is at the moment in terms of the approach of the, of the judges? Historically, you can look back and see uh, an era a long time ago when arbitration was rather suspect um, as um, ousting the jurisdiction of the court. Uh, that disappeared um, many, many, many decades ago. And um, we then entered a period where it was thought that the courts should um, uh, correct any errors of law. And there was a right to have a case stated to the court. Uh, I remember a case stated which uh, went up to the Court of Appeal where Lord Denning um, said it was absolutely correct that the court should um, correct the law and it was, wasn't for arbitrators to lay down um, the law. Uh, went back to the arbitrators, it was remitted, um, and um, came up again to the courts. And Lord Denning, I remember this time, said, 
uh, we must trust the commercial men uh, and leave it to the arbitrators. He was in a minority, but I think his um, philosophy has um, more or less prevailed. Um, the courts um, now, um, uh, particularly since the Arbitration Act 1996, um, uh, but uh, going back to the 70s actually, um, and um, House of Lords authority then intervene uh, only with a very light hand and in cases where errors, possible errors of law are involved, um, they only give permission to come to the court when the error is um, blatant or the case is one of um, a very considerable public importance and um, it's important for an industry or for a particular area of life to have uh, clear guidance as to what the law is. And um, that has actually um, gone so far as to lead to complaints by um, uh, one or two um, senior judges, in including a past Lord Chief Justice, um, to the effect that the courts were uh, on the public were being deprived of authority in um, key areas of life. Uh, I think um, that wasn't a very fair complaint. If people prefer to arbitrate, it is because courts aren't selling themselves well enough and aren't offering a proper service. Um, the um, position is, though, that it is true that um, far, far fewer since the 70s cases have come to court. Um, and the philosophy now is um, intervene, interfere with a very light hand. In other words, um, as Justice Malhotra said, um, with um, very considerable reticence, but promote, recognize and enforce with a strong hand. So help. And um, personally, I, I think um, that um, the commercial judges have in fact um, slightly adapted the practice um, under the authority which I described, um, governing permissions to appeal, um, so as to enable some authority in key areas, particularly the maritime, where the maritime world actually welcomes court authority. They do um, cite it, they know it, they refer to it, and they need it. And so in that area, uh, a little bit of a relaxation of the application of the criteria may have taken place, which has enabled some interesting cases. Uh, when I was in the Supreme Court, we had some um, very uh, interesting one or two commercial cases. But to be blunt, we had more commercial cases coming from um, uh, the overseas jurisdictions which come to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council than we did in the Supreme Court, which um, um, demonstrates the balance. Uh, can I pick up on one point that Justice Chong has made? One of the unique features of Singapore is it's got a legislature with extraordinary agility and speed. So that when a judge signals in a judgment that there is a need for the legislature to reconsider something, that can be done with uh, incredible dispatch. In the United Kingdom, we have a legislative system which could be described as somewhat sclerotic by comparison. Um, and uh, certainly I have ringing in my ears the words of the government when we completed work on the 1996 Arbitration Act, which was, thank you very much, don't come back for 40 years. Uh, how much do you think the inability of the legislature in, in England to correct issues in arbitration has been a problem for the development of arbitration law? Well, perhaps I can return with a question. I mean, identify me particular areas which you would have in mind where the legislature might have um, intervened, Toby. So, so some examples would be um, the particular, uh, let's say to interim measures, Section 44 of the 1996 Arbitration Act has been the subject of a huge amount of litigation in terms of what is, the, what is the actual extent of the powers of the court to make orders in support of an arbitration? Uh, what does it mean, um, assets, for example? And, that, and we've, had, we've had a number of uh, trips to the Court of Appeal to try and get an answer on that. Uh, in Singapore, yeah, I'm, uh, what could have happened is, is a quick legislative clarification. Yes. Well, I would endorse your point about the difficulty of finding room for primary legislation. Um, on the other hand, um, if you try to get a measure through uh, the Lords, at any rate, uh, which says, um, um, which is a blanket measure and allows um, ministers or some other um, uh, route by which subordinate legislation can be made, then that is criticised as um, 
delegating legislative power and abrogating parliamentary sovereignty. So I, I, I'm afraid I have to accept that um, it may um, be unfortunate and um, I'm not au fait with the um, full extent of the problem, which is what you asked me, uh, but I think it is something which um, would merit um, thinking about. Uh, there is sometimes room uh, in the Lords for um, non-controversial non technical measures, if you can find a slot when for some other reason um, there's, um, it's not possible to push through more controversial legislation. So that if there were a focused piece of legislation on Section 44, it might be possible to um, do something. But I, I agree with you, in general, it's pretty difficult, especially at the moment with Brexit, I'm afraid, taking up an awful lot of legislative time. Um, Justice Call, can I can I turn to you and ask and put the same question to you? How, how responsive has the Indian legislature been to signals uh, from judges that there are areas that need to be reconsidered? Uh, when we, um, if you see the history of the legislations, uh, I would go with what Justice Numanotra said that you know there was a time when uh, there was an element of an extra interventionist uh, attitude which was blamed. And I put it on uh, a principle of a pendulum. That's that's weighed with many laws in India. So you know, the pendulum swings one way or the other, and then settles down at a particular point. So there was a time period, and those impressions I think don't need to carry forward were that uh, the courts were really sitting as courts of appeal rather than recognizing how an award uh, should be dealt with. But I, I have seen it. Um, both at the high court level and the Supreme Court level, having sat at both levels and handled matters of this nature, uh, an element of sea change where uh, the approach now has been to, uh, you know, be the least interventionist. And at the first level of objections, the problems which arise sometimes are the quantum of numbers of awards which have been rendered, but that's more in the national awards situation. In that context, uh, we've had a law commission and we have had some observations from the court to loosen up the process by which uh, the legislature should examine. But I think, uh, uh, personally speaking, it's some kind of a middle path, I would say. There was a very active approach adopted for changing, making the legislations more, uh, more friendly towards uh, the arbitration. And that largely arose because once economic activities grew in India and it became conscious of its uh, role in the economic scenario, that it was felt that to have better commerce, you need to have better resolution mechanisms and arbitration is a very important aspect of it. So that's the time when the legislation uh, started rethinking, the, the law commission started making recommendations and the courts also made certain observations. And let me say, I've had experiences uh, with, with uh, Narman also making something and, and it received quite a prompt attention, at least so far as arbitration issues are concerned and commercial arbitration, international and national, I can't say this for all legislative exercises, but in this field, there is a very conscious effort to attend to the issue quickly. Uh, largely, I would say also based on creating a better international perspective that we are alive to the commerce across the world and therefore are providing an appropriate method of adjudication of disputes in commensurate with the economic activity which is taking place. So to pick up on, to pick up on that point, there are, uh, as, as I understand it, there are a number of areas in Indian arbitration law that are still to be settled. Uh, and they are sort of, some of them are, are policy-based issues. Um, and the question arises as to whether these are areas for, for the success of India as a regional hub that should be the domain of judges, or are they better dealt with by the legislature? And I'll give you, I'll give you some examples. So, Example number one would be third party funding. The whether or not third party funding is actually permissible legal in India, as I understand it, there are obiter remarks in various cases. Uh, there's no sort of settled position. Singapore has taken a position of a, a statutory approach. Uh, England has not. Uh, where, where do judges fit in on, on an issue such as that? And how important would that be, do you think, for the future of uh, India as an, as an arbitration hub? If I can, if I ask Justice Call first, and then we'll pass that around. Okay, so um, one is the challenges. Uh, it's the evolutionary challenges which will keep coming. I, I'll deal with this particular point which you've raised. But uh, 
I think the judicial aspect has been quite active in recognizing and ironing out certain situations, but it can't iron out all the issues, some of which may have legislative requirements. And as you said, one of the examples is third party funding. Now, third party funding is a sensitive issue in the concept which is stood in India because uh, it has many uh, ramifications which have to be seen. And the fear, the fear that this may be used in some way to, in the Indian perspective, not go in line with the judicial uh, role and thinking. But uh, since you're mentioning examples, let us see, uh, I, I can give two examples. And one of them, Justice uh, Indra Murotra was part two to it, how I think things have been sorted out in the international commercial arbitration field. So let's take the first example uh, of coming from the judgment of uh, Jacindo Malhotra in Vedanta's case, where the award was made by a tribunal in Malaysia. And uh, the issue arose uh, in, in uh, was examined in appeal and the Indian government was trying to resist the enforcement of the award. And there were high stakes where the government was on one side. I'm giving this as an example because the fact that the government is on one side and high stakes are involved has not weighed with the courts. And um, the, the grounds both on issue of limitation and opposition to public policy, which has been the criticism of our system that we, have ex we used to expand the scope of a public policy to our laws, were clarified by the court. And, um, and uh, it was held that uh, uh, the court does not sit as an appellate jurisdiction to reappreciate the evidence that uh, the government, uh, um, the court significantly held that the seat being Malaysia the courts there had been right to examine the public policy issue in accordance with the Malaysian law. Now that's a far reaching impact considering how uh, a decade ago the courts would take the situation to be. Um, another example was of uh, uh, in the arbitration system itself, a two tier system being provided. Uh, this is because uh, interesting because unsafe trial model law nor the New York convention really gave this right to a losing party in arbitration to seek setting aside of an order based on an, on an uh, appellate forum uh, or a second tier of scrutiny. And yet contractually, the parties agreed to such a tier of scrutiny. Uh, this created an appeal mechanism and the legality of such a mechanism came up before the Supreme Court. And uh, with the, the different view perspective is clear from the fact there was a difference of opinion among two judges, which uh, made the matter go to uh, a larger bench, and uh, the it was uh, it was held that this such contractual arrangement is it was recognized. Court upheld the same based on the recognition that the primacy of a party autonomy is very important, and therefore, if they have provided this kind of a tier of scrutiny, it is possible. So, the courts have been active to tailoring the situation and recognizing. I think two principles. I would say, one is the principle how internationally things are understood and on a principle of committee of nations, the larger principle, and this is operated in many fields. And the other is a principle of party autonomy, which used to be um, some kind of a sufferer in the earlier perspectives of the court. So I think there's a, uh, that's why I, I would tend to agree with Desmond Rutra that there is a thinking process which has changed. And I think this also arises more so I think the last one year has been an example of how things have changed in every adjudicatory process, whether it be arbitration, mediation, uh, courts. And uh, we have recognized how it is important to learn from each other, how commerce will operate, how education must operate to encourage commerce and get different economies back on track. So I don't see any, uh, I don't have any apprehension or look back on the situation judicially. I think we want to look forward. And I'm also of the view that uh, both in legislative enactments uh, wherever possible, things will happen quickly and uh, steps will be taken. One example I thought uh, of India signing the mediation uh, convention in Singapore. It happened so quickly uh, where I think international people were still then realized that India would go through so quickly when it was taken on priority and in, in times which were difficult times to go through it. So I think there is a sea change and I put the credit to the fact that a recognition in the country both uh, judicially and legislatively that if we have to play a role, we have to be in sync with the international thinking. So um, can I go back to Justice Chong for a kind of insight into the, the Singapore approach? Going back to the specific issue as an example of third party funding, 
Why, why is it that in Singapore, that would, that's a matter that, that has been legislated rather than allowed to develop by the judiciary in accordance with the sort of principles that Justice Cool has identified? First, maybe I could give you some background as to what led to the amendment to um, allow third party funding in the arbitration space. Um, we get a lot of feedback from the arbitration community, the, the, the Ministry of Law gets regular kind of uh, uh, feedback from the arbitration players. And one of the points that was raised was that uh, it made them, if, unless we allow third party funding in international arbitration, there could well be a problem with what we call uh, not, not to play in level playing field, because there are some uh, uh, players in the arbitration space who are able to get third party funding because in, in, that, in, the, in their um, uh, jurisdiction, third party funding is permitted. So when you have a Singapore uh, uh, seated arbitration and if you don't allow that, that could be an issue with uh, the, the level playing field. So that led, uh, that was the impetus behind the, the, the amendment to, to try to level the playing field. But the chief re benefit of having the legislature uh, um, authorizing third party funding, I think is self-evident, is certainty. It promotes certainty so that parties uh, who um, uh, take their arbitration, their dispute to uh, Singapore seated arbitration, will have absolute certainty that their award, which they obtain through third party funding in the C Singapore seated arbitration, will not be rendered unenforceable in Singapore. I see, so, so, so long as you have a system where the issue of third party funding, which is a public policy issue, is to be decided by the courts. Obviously, you have a situation where different courts may disagree and thereby give rise to uncertainty, which may then have an impact on the party's choice of arbitration. Because if you, if you need third party funding and if it's perceived that in India, the position is a bit uncertain, it may well affect uh, the party's choice. Um, can, can I turn that over to Justice uh, Malhotra um, uh, as, to, as to how you see the judge's role on those areas where there is their policy questions, such as third party funding, which are, are yet to be settled? This issue, let me tell you very frankly, has really not arisen before the court so far. It's not arisen. There was a comment made in A.K. Balaji in one of the Supreme Court judgments wherein they said, yes, of course, third, third party funding is taking place. It, it, it was more an acknowledgement of the existence of this concept internationally. But this issue has really not come before the court. It's an open area. And until it really arises, there is really no judicial decision on this issue. So it's, it's open ended so far. It's open-ended. There is no embargo. If the issue arises, it will be adjudicated in due course. So there is no embargo as a, there's no prohibition. Can I, can I throw another one at you then? Yes. Um, <laughs> another, another area which is uncertain, but a policy question. Yes. And, the, and the question I'm putting is really, how, how does one understand the judicial role or, or should this be something which is really for the Indian legislature? So the example I'll give you is arbitrability. What is the extent of, the, the, of, of types of disputes that are capable of being arbitrated? Okay, the answer to this is straightforward. You're right that insofar as our act is concerned, there is no dispute which is mentioned which is not arbitrable. It is basically judge-made law, wherein there are two, three judgments, and I'm, I have also authored one of the judgments very recently, wherein we have said that every civil commercial dispute is capable of being resolved through arbitration. But of course, the areas which are not arbitrable are the general areas which are accepted in all jurisdictions. One is of course criminal law, which is visited with penal sanctions. So obviously that's not arbitrable in all jurisdictions. Second is areas where there is special legislation and specialized tribunals which have been constituted. For instance, consumer disputes, etc. And you know, in consumer disputes, you, you really uh, arbitration doesn't work because there's an inequality. There is, you know, it's a beneficial social legislation. So uh, that is decided by specialist specialized tribunals, which are constituted for it. 
Third is, of course, those areas where there are interests which lie in the realm of, uh, you know, the status of a person. For instance, marriage, divorce, um, you know, probate, succession. You can't have it resolved through a domestic, a private tribunal constituted by consent of parties. So these are the three broad areas where if it is governed by special legislation, special courts and tribunals, those are excluded from arbitration. Otherwise, all disputes, including fraud, are today considered to be arbitrable. Civil fraud is arbitrable. So, so I think there is no lack of clarity now on yes. arbitrability. And the courts have been, frankly speaking, expanding the frontiers. Let me tell you very frankly, they've been expanding because in eviction matters, the you know traditional view was that no, no, we have rent control, uh, you know, legislation, etc. Now all that you know is now being overruled. They said, why can't it be resolved? Even family disputes do go where it's not a matter really <clears throat> of the status of a person, but there are disputes between two parties or family. Those are being resolved through arbitration. So the frontiers are being expanded through judicial dicta. But the legislature has left it uh, broadly, basically, whatever other, you know, common exceptions in all jurisdictions, that's broadly being followed in India, too. I don't think there is any issue with respect to arbitrability. So now let me um, put Lord Mance on the spot very unfairly, uh, if I may. Um, if, if we take up what Justice Malhotra has said about arbitrability. Uh, so this is an area which is undoubtedly policy based. It's an area which uh, in English law, we don't have any statute on. Uh, we don't have that much guidance in the textbooks actually. Um, and as Justice Malhotra has identified, frontiers are being expanded by judges. And we know that that's true because uh, over the years, many things that one would have said conventionally are not arbitrable have become arbitrable, like competition law, antitrust, for example. So what goes through the judicial mind how does the judge approach a question like that when you're being asked whether something is arbitrable or not, whether it should be arbitrable or not? Um, how, how does a judge, for example, uh, in your experience in, in, in an apex court, uh, deal with that kind of question broadly? What's the sort of philosophy? Well, I think the, the, the first answer is that um, I don't recall uh, any case coming um, to an apex court when I was there. Uh, but um, you are right, um, one is conscious that um, um, matters relating to, for example, insolvency um, now um, uh, have come um, before us and um, been regarded as arbitral. I, 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 can, I can actually I recall one um, such matter specifically, so perhaps I qualify what I said initially. Um, how do you decide that sort of issue? Uh, well, I think there is obviously a distinction between legislative and judicial activity, but um, the borderline is sometimes um, um, a grey area. The judges, after all, um, effectively um, invented the common law um, over the centuries. Um, it didn't emerge from some um, Anglo-Saxon paradise. And um, where you have a legislature which is not keen to intervene and is not activist, uh, uh, as it is in Singapore, uh, inevitably, um, the judiciary has to take some of the burden. And um, when you are adjudicating on that sort of issue, <clears throat> you look at um, what you can call with a small p uh, policy matters. Um, and um, obviously, um, one consideration is um, um, party autonomy, which um, is a, the governing principle of arbitration. Um, the countervailing consideration is um, um, whether there is some overriding public interest. Um, uh, as you say, um, um, the only safeguards, uh, the only qualification on party autonomy is um, the public interest under uh, Section 1 of the Arbitration Act um, that's actually specified. Um, so you would have to find um, some uh, real public interest why this should take place in public, in a court, um, rather than be uh, adjudicated privately. And uh, over the decades, uh, the balance has undoubtedly um, moved slightly in favour of um, um, the ability um, to agree to um, private arbitration. Uh, sometimes there's been a countervailing tendency, as we know, um, uh, people uh, insisting that uh, arbitration should be a bit less private in the public interest. Uh, uh, but um, 
the other factor, apart from um, some overriding public consideration, which uh, militates in favor of public debate, uh, is practicability, uh, feasibility, uh, is there some feature of the dispute which necessitates the court's mandatory powers um, and which um, really doesn't uh, work or work satisfactorily if you remit it um, to um, arbitration. So I think um, those are the sort of pragmatic considerations which would um, uh, influence a um, court in deciding on that. Um, as you say, the area of um, non-arbitrability has um, shrunk very considerably. Thank you very much. Um, can I shift gears slightly and raise, and raise one other issue which leads on from what we've discussed so far? Uh, we're, we're all agreed and you've all explained uh, about the, the reality of minimal judicial interference in arbitration. There's a parallel universe that exists, which is the world of arbitrators sitting in arbitration, suffering from what has become known as due process paranoia. Uh, what that means is that arbitrators have become timid and generally the complaint is that they are worried about doing anything too drastic because somebody will raise a due process complaint and then there'll be an application to challenge the arbitrator or set aside the award or resist recognition and enforcement. So we've got these inconsistent positions with judges on the one hand saying we do not intervene, intervene, intervene unduly. And on the other hand, arbitrators worry that they might. How, how do we bridge that gap? Um, can, I, can I ask uh, Justice Call? I think, I think you're on, yes. Yeah, personally speaking, my view has been that uh, uh, an arbitrator is a chosen judge of the party. You choose the judge. And if you choose the judge, you better take the award. So that's one philosophy. But yes, you are right. Because of some past history, there may be an apprehension in the arbitrators to act on the side of caution. But the side of caution, to my mind, uh, should be based on a pragmatism of the business sense. Why is there an arbitration? Is it only because we want an alternative route or easing the pressures from the court? I don't think so. I think the reason is you pick up experts in a particular field often who are able to decide issues, especially of commerce, better than a regular court and the time consuming consumption which used to be there. So once they're there, I would expect now that with the given opinions which are coming forth, at least from Indian perspective, I can say that the arbitrators, as long as they act within the best interest of business, the courts are uh, uni universally not liable to interfere in the same. <laughs> From the court's perspective, um, I would say this philosophy which I was mentioning is slowly permeating. Yes, there are some cases where, uh, if I may be frank, where you feel there is something absolutely wrong in the way the arbitrator has gone about it. There can be situations which can happen. And they're less, less to do with the subject, but more person-centric which arises. It's not that it doesn't happen, so let us acknowledge it. In that case, everything else goes to the side. You feel something wrong has been dealt, uh, um, or, or at times very rarely, but you feel the award really, if I can't use better expressions, stinks. If that is the position, all legalities goes to one side and you feel low. This is a matter which needs to be redone up. Maybe it needs to be just re-argued or re-heard in some way by a direction, but not this award. So the balancing factor, I think, is that if the arbitrators are doing a commercial job based on commercial consideration, I don't see, in today's perspective, the court being activist in interfering. Uh, and if, if this is a comfort level which, will, which is arriving and will arrive only by the opinions of the court, if a perspective is formed of uh, the arbitrators based on earlier opinions of the court, then those perspectives have to give way to the opinions which are prevailing at the time being. Lord, Lord Mans. Yes, I, I think this is a very interesting question. Um, and I think we shouldn't, uh, while uh, autonomy is uh, an, uh, the absolute guiding principle and um, one which one approves of um, in um, life in general and not just in arbitration, um, one shouldn't be um, ignore the fact that um, uh, there is a risk of a downside in the arbitral field. And uh, I think you yourself, Toby, have spoken on this. Um, uh, it leads to the selection of arbitrators. That itself generates a certain amount of um, 
mutual suspicion that um, the opposing, opposing party may perhaps have chosen someone um, who um, uh, would um, favor their case. Indeed, um, there are, I think it has been said that um, by one point or that the object of appointment is to appoint someone who um, you believe um, has the maximum likelihood that they will decide in their favor, but um, the minimum likelihood that they will be challenged. Um, and there is a, I, I think this is what you've spoken on, the centripetal tendency. In other words, um, a small clique of um, people, a small group, clique is perhaps uh, unduly um, uh, impolite, but a small group of people gets appointed with um, the consequent um, reaction that there's a lack of diversity, which is true. And uh, there's been a lot of attention paid to that in uh, recent years. And I don't know how far the pledge has really had a, a change, but the statistics still suggest that um, uh, the um, diversity is pretty limited. Um, and um, then of course, the fact that you've got a closed group uh, of people who've necessarily got connections with themselves and with parties leads to suggestions of conflicts. The other area of autonomy which creates a problem, um, I think, is um, um, that it um, carries with it control of procedure. Most arbitral rules have in it uh, the provision that the arbitrator can decide unless the parties have already agreed. And if parties agree um, um, time limits, three months for pleadings, for example, which um, in court would be completely unacceptable, um, you can't do anything about it. So I, I think we shouldn't be blind to, to and think that um, autonomy is um, uh, absolutely God-given blessing. It does have some problems which we ought to work on, um, particularly when arbitrations are conducted by lawyers and it is the lawyers making the procedural decisions, for example, um, um, for their clients. But uh, there are procedural steps which primarily, again, concern the lawyers. Now, I hope I haven't um, been... Um, too disruptive of a, of, of a rosy view of arbitration, but I do see a force in what you and others have said in this in these areas. Justice John. Uh, certainly from my own experience, Toby, I've not detected any kind of arbitrator paranoia in the awards which have come before the Singapore courts, but I, I, I accept that that experience may vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and it depends on how intervention is at jurisdiction uh, may or may not be. But, I mean, speaking aloud, I think uh, arbitrators having a sense of paranoia is not a bad thing. Uh, it's not a bad thing because ultimately uh, they have a reputation to maintain. Although their merits uh, cannot be challenged, if the awards are, are set aside because they have exceeded jurisdiction or they are found liable for breach of natural justice, I'm sure it, it will affect their reputation and it will affect their ability to be appointed in subsequent uh, um, arbitrations. So in that sense, uh, I you know, am not at all, uh, um, um, I don't think it's a negative development that arbitrators should feel uh, a certain sense of, 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 uh, of um, uh, reservation in exceeding uh, um, uh, what um, the parties expect them to do in, in, in a uh, uh, commercial arbitration. And, and, but, but having said that, what uh, I want to say is that ultimately the, the avenues for the court to intervene are limited. And we, we, if the parties chose a particular um, uh, um, arbitral uh, tribunal, and they get it wrong on the merits, then our, re our response has always been, it's too bad. You got to live with the consequences. You chose them, you got to live with those consequences. But if they have misbehaved, for example, uh, exceeded their jurisdiction or they committed a breach of natural justice, et cetera, or decided a case that's against public policy, then and only then will the court intervene. Yeah. Justice Malhotra, please. I do want to supplement what uh, Justice, uh, uh, the judge from Singapore has just said. I do believe very firmly that there should be a paranoia for arbitrators because it's a one-stop adjudication. <laughs> the objections which you can file are extremely limited. In the course, you have three tiers of judicial scrutiny. 
here there are private members who are adjudicating on a dispute. They must observe due process. Natural justice has to be complied because fair and equal treatment is a mandatory requirement. It's not something which is derogable and you can, you know, let it pass. You cannot because this is the only one stop adjudication. It has to be a fair process. And uh, I think it would be, uh, you know, wrong of an arbitrator to just, uh, you know, act in defiance of principles of natural justice. It would certainly, you know, undermine the award and the proceedings. And I think it has to be observed strictly. I, I believe that it must be observed strictly so that you get a fair outcome and a fair resolution. And in the Indian statute, you normally cannot, you know, remove the arbitrator during pendency of proceedings. Mm -hmm. You can raise these objections only at the post-award stage. And that, of course, applies to part one of our act, which is domestic arbitrations and India seated international commercial arbitrations. You really can't remove them because, you know, if you raise a challenge, it first goes to the tribunal itself. And if the tribunal feels that there is, you know, nothing remiss, then the proceedings go on, award is passed. You raise the objections only after the award is passed. So I do believe that there must be strict observance of natural justice if it's to be a one-stop adjudication, which has to be fair and, uh, you know, transparent. So where the issue comes is on the other side of this debate, which is if you are overly robust and strict as a judge, what you may instill in tribunals in terms of paranoia is a reluctance to, for example, strike out or, or make, make some peremptory order or an unless order, because people are so terrified, tribunals are terrified, that somebody will say, well, if you're going to stop me from proceeding because I have, I've, I've broken all your rules, I'm going to um, reserve my rights and due process. So, so that's, that's where uh, paranoia may turn into paralysis. And the question is, what can judges do to stop that? See, that was actually not when we, I was talking about due process, I meant in fair and equal treatment that you can't, you know, just, um, and that is the issue which has come about diversity of tribunals because it is felt, especially in developing countries, that there is some kind of a bias. And, uh, you know, especially in investment treaty arbitrations, developing countries feel that they have really got, uh, you know, the um, uh, it's, it's been very uh, one-sided, etc., so those issues have arisen. They feel that there is lack of transparency. So I feel the entire process must be fair. But striking out, passing orders and all, I don't think that is an issue of due process. Yeah. Of course, the person must be dynamic when they are adjudicating. There's nothing wrong with that. It's only the process must be fair. Both parties must be given an equal yeah. right to lead evidence. So that is what I feel is the implication of due process. Lord Manson. I, I think I agree with what you said a moment ago, Toby. Um, there are uh, too many references, um, uh, probably in correspondence, to um, their lack of process here. Um, and um, courts um, should be very careful not to go over the top. And uh, if you get, um, uh, if people are really um, um, foolhardy enough to carry um, r really rather extreme complaints to a court, a court should make quite clear that the test is one of fairness and that um, they're not going to um, um, listen to complaints um, which um, really uh, have no substance in them uh, and are highly technical. I mean, some of the, um, it's, uh, the area of conflict of interest which was discussed in Halliburton, some of the um, matters which are regarded as um, material a strike a former judge is quite strange. I mean, uh, as a judge, I have no interest in the identity of um, solicitors or, or even counsel, except to the extent that their arguments are good. And that doesn't interest me in them. Uh, it interests me in the arguments. But in the world of arbitration, um, uh, the uh, extent of disclosure of um, prior connections, and um, even if it's just um, in cases where a solicitor was involved, is um, going to a, an extreme which I don't believe any court would um, enforce um, mm. but it's a practice which has grown up and um, I'm not sure that um, the IBA guidelines don't uh, to some extent encourage it um, so um, uh, I think when cases come in front of courts they've got to make it very clear that they're applying a sensible concept of fairness and they're really looking for something pretty fundamental if they're going to intervene. Would anybody else like to add to that before we move on? I'm just conscious we're actually running into... Yes, just, just a school, of course. 
See, what I am saying is that when a judge pronounces a judgment, at least in the Indian context, it gets into a public debate, a lot of it. And that's the check and balance when a judgment comes into public debate. There may be two points of view. That doesn't often happen with an arbitration, in the sense that you'll know the net result of the arbitration, but it doesn't happen. So uh, I don't think, uh, if it is a little bit of fear of performance, I don't think there's any harm in it. Yes, uh, fear not to take action which is expedient for an earlier uh, resolution of the dispute should not occur. I think that's a misconceived fear, if I may say so, of thinking that uh, you know if I don't do this, then something else is going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, yet we have to keep in mind one factor. You know, there were times when in India uh, a non-speaking award was permitted, and it used to be called the judicially it was defined as a snake bite. Uh, it had no remedies. So in a lesser sense. Uh, when an award is uh, rendered today and with wanting reduced tiers of scrutiny, which is very important, uh, if the performance at the first level has to be good enough and the interventions have to be low. In that, it should be nothing more than what I would call is a little bit of fear of performance. So I, <laughs> thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to quickly switch the topics because we're running out of time. And I want, to, I want to ask some questions which for me are potentially career shortening. And that is the issue of judicial training. To what extent should judges uh, be trained continuously to keep up to date in international arbitration? International arbitration is a fast moving field. There are specialized areas such as investor state arbitration. We kind of assume that the judge will know. There are some concerns involving nobody on this panel that some judges last did an arbitration when the field looked quite different and it's changed. So how do we deal with that? Is that a problem? Are judges open to training? And if they are, how, how might that be done? Justice Malhotra. This is a very, very important issue. In fact, I've spoken about it in almost every webinar. I think it's critical for judges, both sitting and retired judges, to be trained, particularly in investor state arbitrations, because it's conceptually entirely different from an ordinary international commercial arbitration since it lies in the domain of public international law emanating from treaty obligations. Now, you are absolutely right that all judges require the specialized training so as to realize that there are issues and disputes which come, which could potentially lead to an investor claim under the treaties. Therefore, they require to be trained uh, that, you know, what would be the impact of a particular decision. So I think it certainly requires intensive training and I, I do feel that there is lack of training. We need to resort to it in India. I, I will confess and it's extremely important because the concepts in investors tra treaty uh, arbitrations is entirely different from an international commercial arbitration, which is you know based on private international law and the uh, commercial disputes. So I think it has to be taken on a war footing and the way forward is, and particularly in the Indian context, after the, uh, the, in the in aftermath of the white industries case, given the spate of claims which have been filed and are being filed against the Republic of India, and each of us as citizens of this country are affected because if an adverse claim comes, it goes out of the taxpayers, uh, this thing, otherwise how does the government meet it? And it is a matter of serious concern for us because these claims are being filed and very often people who are appointed to the tribunals are unaware of the concepts which are required to be followed in an investment treaty arbitration. The way forward is probably have some you know, persons of repute internationally or arbitral institutions to come and have webinars and uh, you know, after the pandemic is over probably you know, in uh, have proper training courses. I, I, we are very open to it and I think it should be done. In fact, I had uh, suggested to the Chief Justice of India that the Permanent Court of Arbitration was very keen to do it. I do think it should be done on a war footing. We are one of the most affected countries given the spate of claims which are being filed. Certainly we need that. Can I turn it over to Justice Chong? Um, the, um, in terms of educating the court, even, even aside from specialized cases, such as investor state. Um, what is the Singapore approach to judicial training? And, uh, and, and just to add on to that, Singapore has a, a, a good experience with using um, amicus or interveners who come along and, and will, uh, will assist the court. Um, perhaps you can just tell us a little bit about how, how that works in Singapore and whether you think that's sort of needed or valuable. 
Well, the way we deal with uh, arbitration cases, we have a specialized list uh, where uh, judges who typically were from a private practice who are active in arbitration, who are familiar with arbitration, would be on that list. So um, arbitration related cases will not be heard by all high court judges, but judges in the specialist um, arbitration list. Two, we, we, we believe in continuing legal education. We have a, um, a judicial college where we have um, um, invite lecturers from uh, the universities uh, to, to update us on the laws, particularly as you pointed out in, in versus state arbitration. But in, in a, a case, for example, where we feel uh, either because it is very technical and uh, that, that point of law has not uh, come before us, or sometimes in a given case where uh, we feel that the, the um, parties are not represented by lawyers who we believe will provide us with the best assistance in a given case with, with a kind of wide ranging kind of uh, ramifications, we typically would invite an amicus. And uh, the, the appointment would, would be usually uh, from the university academics with no interest in the outcome, no interest in the parties, no interest in the law firms. And the way we, 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 we um, uh, um, manage that process, number one, we inform the parties of our intention to appoint an amicus and to see their reactions. And usually the answer is they have no issue. Number two, we identify uh, a, a, a few potential candidates for the party's consideration. Obviously the ultimate choice will be left to the, the court. Uh, and, and, so, and third, uh, once the, the brief comes in, of course the, the, the briefs will be circulated to all the party and typically, when um, uh, in terms of um, uh, order of speeches in, in court, we will invite the amicus to speak first so that the parties will have the opportunity to respond to the opinions of the amicus. So that's how we've managed it. And we have managed it very well, not just in arbitration related cases, but cases where it affects um, the, you know, uh, society. Uh, affects uh, uh, certain uh, rights, which which I think has a kind of big national impact. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we have about one minute left. Uh, Lord Lord Mans, please. Yes. No, just very quickly. I mean, tactfully, we've always called it studies, not training in the UK. Uh, I think judges are intellectually curious and are actually interested in attending uh, uh, out of court sessions and learning um, in court. Uh, our amicuses have a lesser role to a Singapore amicus. Um, uh, we rely quite a lot on third party interventions, uh, as in Halliburton, um, to um, supply expertise. Mm. But I think um, that judicial studies are extremely fruitful and helpful and actually enjoyable. Uh, they are sometimes operate over a weekend. Um, yeah. Uh, we, we are we're running to the to the end, but there's one last question that I, I have to ask all of you. Uh, and that is with all the uh, experience that you have uh, brilliantly uh, explained and revealed to us uh, uh, sitting as judges in arbitration matters and everything you've seen, my question to you is, do retired judges make good arbitrators? <laughs> Justice Malhotra. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, <is> it, <laughs> I think I let that question pass later. <laughs> The other judges respond to it. I've just emitted office, so I won't comment on that. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Justice Cole. Well, my answer would be yes, if you know the subject. Yeah. Okay. The subject, no. Therefore, it's a time for specialized training from the last question for specialized jurisdictions, for specialized judges to handle specialized kind of cases. The, the era, I think, of generalists is slowly getting over. You will have to have people who know the subject. Justice Chong. I agree with Justice Cole. I mean, uh, uh, you know, judges would have the correct temperament to, to um, adjudicate disputes. And um, also, if you, if you have subject matter expertise, uh, or if you don't have subject uh, matter expertise, you should decline the appointment. 
and I, I certainly think that uh, um, um, retired judges, um, you know, would make good um, arbitrators. Lord Mans. It's for others to answer, Toby. Uh, all I'll say is that uh, uh, it has been an interesting experience um, to return to the world of arbitration, and I hope um, retired judges give value. Yes. Thank you all very much. That brings us uh, to the end of our session. Uh, we haven't had time for uh, Q&A, um, and I feel like we've only begun uh, to scratch the surface on a number of very big topics. So perhaps this is a prelude to, uh, to further panels. Um, but with that, I would, I would like to thank everybody very much um, for, for all your participation and, and really a very, very interesting um, insights. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. Thank you all. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you.